Welcome to the Tech Diva Success Podcast. This is a short weekly podcast that focuses on tools, processes, and best practices that truly fuel success for women in technology. We thank you for tuning in, and we hope you walk away with at least one best practice that will help you level up personally or professionally. What can you take action on that will make you 1% better? This show gives us space to grow that amazing potential you have inside of you by bringing you guests from all walks of life and allowing them to share their success secrets with you. I'm your host, Nicole Scheffler, and I consider myself a tech diva with over 15 years experience in a technology career. And I'm committed to sparking tech diva success with my collection of various books, podcasts, and projects, including our other podcast, the Diva Tech Talk podcast, which is all here to inspire you and is dedicated to women in technology. I know you're going to love it. So on with the show. On this episode of the Tech Diva Success Podcast, we are going to be inspired by Alana Karen. She is an award-winning tech leader. So she's walked the walk. She's an author and a speaker whose work impacts many of our everyday lives, from Google search ads, fiber to Google grants and beyond. She has been leading the charge to develop and scale product development and drive teams that has a ripple in our technology industry. She's spoken at many, many conferences and summits, one of which is where I met her, on leadership, diversity, equality and inclusion, talent and innovation and she has a book adventures of women in tech how we got here and why we stay that is going to be coming out so that is going to aggregate hundreds of stories on these topics so look out for that and she lives with her three children and her husband and her two dog children (laughs) in the san francisco bay area so i'm really happy to be on with you today thank you so much alana thank you great to be here was there anything i missed about you that you want to call out Yeah, I mean, I think it's really funny how we write bios nowadays. I actually had a really hard time and had to have a friend help me because, you know, you're supposed to sound like this amazing, awesome being that sprung upon the universe. Mine sounds amazing. And yet I think what it misses is that I started at the bottom, basically. Like I joined tech on the front lines of our ads product at Google. I reviewed and approved ads. I answered customer email. I took on a project around policy that ultimately became a full-time job creating, implementing, and maintaining policies for ads and other products and built out a global team over 10 years, then moved on to Google Fiber, did it again for a whole new product to Google for another five years. And I've had another great arc now at Search where I've built out another team for program management. So it's funny what bios leave out. But yeah, all the hard work. It left out all the hard work. (laughs) I think I was reading Rachel Hollis or something, and she pointed out that you see who people are at the top, and you forget all the places that they've been to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. It's little actions, little steps along the way. And kudos to you. It sounds like you just talked through a lot of those steps and now being a director at Google, sometimes people see your director in search and it makes it a lot more real when you say, hey, we all started just dipping our toes in the water before we were cannonballing into the deep end. So, Or you'll remember like, you know, starting out speaking at conferences, it's not usually that someone tapped you, you applied and said, I have this topic. And then because either you were putting a lot on social media or you started to show up at these conferences, other people start asking you. Well, that's when a lot of people see you and they assume that now you're this dignitary, but you started with everyone else having to put yourself out there and ask for the opportunity. Like frankly, a secret in my career that I didn't figure out till way too late that you had to ask for it. That comes with not being afraid to fail or being rejected. So for every 10 conferences, you may get three or four, but like you said, as you grow that body, and it doesn't have to be just about inspiring women. It could be on your technical topic. It could be on obviously diversity and empowerment like we do on this show, but there's so many things that you could put your brand out there for to start to share your expertise with others 
and grow opportunities. All right. Well, you know, we have a short time today and I'm excited to dig in because I know you have a lot of things from this amazing journey that you want to share with our women in tech to help them be more successful. So where do you want to start? Yeah. So I interviewed 80 plus women for my book, The Adventures of Women in Tech. And what I saw was that there were certain things that actually resonated with me. So they're what I learned in my career too. What I would say is like a lot of us think that these things are maybe we're bored with them, but it was clear to me that like these were skills that they developed that really helped them. And so I'll give the quick example of resilience. I won't spend a ton of time on this one because people are talking about this a ton now. They'll call it grit, they'll call it thick skin, whatever kind of term resonates mostly with them. Resilience for me, I love because it sounds like a muscle, a muscle that you build to become stronger, to help you navigate the situations that you're going through. And that's very much what I experienced in my life. You know, I look back and I think if I had just been a little bit more hurt or offended by some of the things that happened as I was navigating a career in tech, I wouldn't be here 20 years later. But I frankly had been raised by parents that helped me develop a tough skin. (laughs) And then I further developed a tough skin as I was making my way here. And I think it just really helped me mostly to take those days, those one-off days that aren't great and not take them so seriously. Or if it's been a lot of bad days to have some kind of muscle to know how to deal with it and what to do. So that's one of my big things. Speaking about my resume, my bio earlier, another thing was about marketing a lot of women were uncomfortable marketing themselves. And it was pretty clear that the women who felt success over time had learned how to market their talents and speak up. And I think I'm still, I'm totally on that journey still. I'm not even sure I, I weren't the tech diva gnomer that this, this podcast comes with. No, you it. absolutely do. <laughs> you absolutely do. <laughs> I'm just saying it's natural in all of us, right? And it's that imposter syndrome or that self-doubt or whatnot. Also, I I do talk about this in the book. There's definitely things where women can be penalized for bragging much more than men are. So I think we've also been taught a little bit to stay quiet or to not tout those accomplishments. So part of what I cover in the book is some of the ways women figured out how to do it and feel comfortable with it, because I think that's a big, a big thing, too. Can you give us some of those? I know one I use is speaking not with I, but with we. So, I mean, obviously, everyone yeah. needs to go get the book <laughs> to read it all. But do you have everyone some buy the book. Yeah. Um, no, you are not alone. Uh, a big thing that women find is helpful because we are expected by society to be team players and care for others. Many women play into the we the I'm doing this because it will help us all narrative. I typically use it during negotiations, right? Like I'm in here talking to you about my salary because if I'm a senior woman and I can't do it, who can? And I need to speak up for other senior women and other women in the organization. So the we helps us. I think it helps us feel better about it, but also helps people take it better. Other people have have very specific things where they found that they started small speaking up, right? Just taking something small in a meeting and, you know, not trying to wage this huge battle or take up a lot of error time, but interjecting their voice, speaking up. And then that gave them the confidence to speak with more content, more hard subjects. And they built on it from there. So there was kind of a a start small narrative, pick something small and put yourself out there. And a lot of just ask, right? Worst thing you'll get is a no, but ask for what you want. Say that you are interested in learning something new. Say you're interested in that job that you heard is opening up. Tell your manager what you might be interested in down the road. Do it, lay that groundwork. And again, like worst thing you can get is, no, we can't do that. You can't be a manager yet, whatever it is. But it still plants the seeds in their minds that that could be later. Yep. That's really great. I also have a little success secret here that I found is providing the clear record of my successes, which is kind of marketing yourself up to your manager. Because 
you know, in corporate America, they're always looking for this winner, this of the quarter, this recognition. And whether it's recognition or just acknowledgement of everything you've done, putting it into a record and giving it to your manager proactively has always um, helped me. So that was just another little tip I'll add, throw into the mix here. What else do you have for us? Yeah, the other one that I was thinking about was find support, which I think you've talked about on this podcast before, but very big theme that we're not alone. I think a big thing people would often say, I found my people there, or I stayed because I liked the people, or there, there was this personal connection element. And so some of this was around how do you pick your job? How do you pick your boss? But some of it was also just about the connections that you can make, whether it's that you go to women's conferences and you meet each other or smaller things where you're reaching out on LinkedIn and finding people who have common interests, Facebook groups where there might be these women in tech type conversations going on. There's various ones. What that was clear to me was that the people who did that were often helped through difficult moments in their career. And that made all the difference where they might have left their job or they might have struggled or they might not have stood up for what they needed to or left the job that they should leave very, very much so because it wasn't a supportive culture and that it was other people who helped them through those hard times at the same time as giving them a feeling of belonging. And the people who navigated alone, a lot of them were fine, but you could tell that they often doubted themselves more because they didn't have that network. And so I'm a huge, huge fan. It took me late in the game, actually, I think, to recognize the value of this because I came to tech and I just worked really hard around the clock. And so now I'm a big believer in telling other people and and touting it. Ooh, that was a really juicy one. I liked that one for sure. What else do you have in success tips? Well, I think the final big one is really around owning your awesome which was something that I came up with. And I mean, you could call it confidence, but it was really interesting interviewing all of these women who I would call amazing, strong, awesome women and seeing the self-doubt that they had or the ways they self-criticized or worried or that the journey that they took to get beyond that and really embrace their awesome and, and, be comfortable saying that I'm worth it. Like I'm important. I'm worth it. I'm worth help at home. I'm worth asking for help at work. I'm worth uh, a better job. This company isn't respecting me. You know, whatever it is, that journey. And, you know, in my mind, if we could all go through this journey faster, it would be amazing because imagine if you had a 20 year old who believed that they could speak up in the room instead of at 25, a 30 year old who believed they could be senior manager, you know, before they were like, it would really help us all in this journey because we would have this progression through leadership that we're all looking for. It comes first with us recognizing ourselves and our own talents and I really believe in this one because it, it took me a long time and I talk about the journey in the book. I was. 11 years into Google and I went to a conference just for women and I was sitting there and I realized, oh wait, like I need to be me and it's important for me to be me and not be cookie cutter like everybody else, but embrace my own awesome and use that and use my beliefs in people and the way I can motivate people and drive great teams and and really leverage that instead of whatever it was that other people were good at, you know, spreadsheets and charts and whatnot. Like that wasn't me, but maybe it's you and you should leverage that and double down on those strengths. Yeah. So what advice do you have about owning your awesome when people get complacent or subtle? And a funny analogy would be when you're young and you're kind of dating the guy that, you know, (laughs) is it really the one, but you keep dating him anyway and you kind of settle and you don't really want to go past that. It's a, the idea of getting complacent and settling in your career. Totally. I use the bad boyfriend metaphor all the time for for (laughs) bad companies. I think of my life and phases now. And so part of my answer is 
maybe that's okay for you now. Maybe you're not bitter about it. Maybe you're not angry. Maybe you made that decision intentionally because you've got two kids under five years old and you need to survive at work and survive at home. And you're really in this progression of what you were like in your 20s. Now you're at a challenging point, maybe in your 30s. And you have intentionally decided that this period of time, you are, you know, resting and investing to use the less, most complimentary term for it. That's fine if you're happy and that's intentional and that's been your decision. But if somehow you've been allowed to be convinced that that's all you are and that's all you're capable of and you should stay safe, but you really want more or it's damaging to you, you know, you feel you don't, you're not excited to go to work. You don't want to go to work. It's damaging to you. Then that's where I think that you have to pay a lot of attention and be really intentional, right? Okay. So if it's still like this in six months, maybe I should start looking for a new job or I'm going to give it another year to see if I can turn this culture around. But if in a year I'm still experiencing X, Y, or Z, then it's time for me to look for a new job or I'm fine right now that this year will just be me surviving because there's COVID and the kids are home and all of that. But next year I'm going to want to accelerate and look for new opportunities within my role or look for that promotion. So I think that it's all okay potentially if you're okay with it and you're being explicit. And at any point that you aren't and you're sacrificing yourself, that's not cool, right? Don't give a company free labor, whether it's free physical, emotional, or anything. You need to know what it gives you and take a step back when you're in those moments where you don't feel that. So in order to achieve that, is the actionable thing to write down your goals? Uh, Just like the bad boyfriend example, I'm not sure people can always recognize when you're being complacent. So how do you think people can fight that? Yeah, that's a good point. I think that there's a piece which is scheduled and there's another piece that you'll just have to pay attention to. So you can schedule these check-ins where you ask yourself certain questions. You decide what questions work for you, but I'll give you my four questions I ask myself. Do I like what I'm doing? Am I learning from it? Do I like who I work with? Am I having fun? So I have asked that to myself on a yearly basis for, I don't know, 15 years. I came up with those questions and they work for me because if any of those answers aren't true, then that is the trigger for me to think about the next year and how I would change those questions. And it could be within role, within team, or it could be time to look for something else. But those are the triggers for me. And I can just think about that basically at the end of every year. You can put it on your calendar if you're the type of person that life just sweeps by you and you don't know. But it, it's, it's pretty, you know, you can, whatever is your kind of turning point. Maybe you have a fiscal calendar, maybe it's school year for you. Easy to kind of remember and do it and reflect. The part that I think that is harder is that if you've got, if you think like the job has changed and it's been kind of like almost like that slow boil around you, that metaphor of slowly boiling the crab. And you look around you and the job has changed and you don't enjoy coming back to work. You're not getting that learning experience that you want. You know, there's a pattern to it. It's not a bad day here, a bad day here, but you you feel consistently like you're not happy or fulfilled. You need to pay attention. That's not schedulable, right? Like that's going to happen and you're going to have to be really self-aware and be like, oh, that's why I'm grumpy or that's why I'm not enthusiastic anymore. And so that piece, I can't exactly tell you a totally actionable thing, except to recognize, I think, that that is legitimate, that how you feel is legitimate and that you should recognize that and think about it, right? And maybe not make 
huge life decisions when you're super emotional or angry at someone, but reflect on it and think about it and decide whether or not that means that you need to change something. I really resonate with that because I think you have goals and things that you can set to do. And then you have kind of like your intuition calling on you and kind of knowing that things don't feel right. And that's not going to be something you can schedule in your calendar. It could be shifts in the economy, in the politics, in your organization and leadership. And that's why it's so important. And people talk about leadership because sometimes it makes you want to reevaluate things as well, who you're working for. And I love some of the stuff you had there around not giving away anything for free and being happy. And it sounds like owning your awesome is pretty a key to happiness. <laughs> I do think so. I mean, a lot of us are really made happy by helping others and giving to others. I'm one of those people. But, you know, the further I got into the career, the more team members I had, the more children I had, I realized I really had to stop and give something to myself because otherwise you run out and you aren't happy and then you can't help others and it's a vicious cycle. And what are some ways that you give to yourself? So I used to be a big getting a massage fan, but in today's world, I've had to cut down on that. And so I do a lot more yoga, which is funny because I was never that person. I in fact found it too peaceful. But now I think with the world, the way it is and the chaos, I'm finding that regular yoga and Pilates is just exactly what I need to wind down from the day. And it gives me a separation that I sometimes need between work and my life. And I wonder whether I'm now hooked for life or whether this is just a phase, whether this will be my yoga phase. But I have a goal to touch my toes, which I haven't done in so many years, I don't even know when, probably since high school. So if I touch my toes, I'm going to take a photo and post it everywhere. You'll all see. <laughs> Goals beyond the career here. Well, I love that. And hopefully it is yoga for life. There's a lot of benefits of it. I've personally found a lot of solstice in walking, getting out in nature and tuning out because we tend to be working from home where we're just so in it and to have that moment alone, especially as a mom and be able to get the support from, you know, your family to be able to say, I need to just walk for like 30, 45 minutes and know you can jam out to some kind of music or listen to an audio book or both and come back. Well, we're towards the end of our show. Is there one last thing you want to leave our listeners with? I always say this, and I mentioned it earlier, but I cannot emphasize enough, ask. Just ask. I can't emphasize how much I think my career would be different if I'd learned that 15 years earlier. And not so much that I haven't enjoyed my career, but there were things I wanted to do, and I kept it inside. And I hoped people would recognize me, or I didn't understand why people weren't recognizing me. And later on, I realized other people were asking. And I think that is also a form of owning your awesome, that you deserve the opportunity, that you have a voice and that you should ask. And so I, just a huge confidence thing for me. And you can start small if it makes you uncomfortable, but I definitely now march around telling people ask. And I'm a certified Jack Canfield success coach, but in that just ask is an entire chapter. The simple just ask along with taking action. And I think those go hand in hand. So leaving our listeners with a wonderful tip, lots of good things packed in here around resilience, uh, marketing yourself, a little humble bragging, uh, getting that support system, and most of all, owning your awesome, which you do. And I think I'm with you on the journey. I think it's just a constant learning curve. And you're just like technology where you're always learning something new. I think there's always something new to learn to be that 1% better, which is exactly why we do this show. So hopefully our listeners got something out of that. If they want to reach out to you or grab that book that you have, uh, what's the best way to do so? They should visit alanakaren.com. Sign up for my newsletter. Wonderful. Well, kudos to you. I know that it's no small task to be successful in your career. A wonderful mother as well. A good human being. And then to come on to our show, we really appreciate it. And sharing your wisdom and connecting on this show has been really awesome. And I really appreciate you. Thank you. 
Thank you again for listening. And we really hope this sparks something in you that you can use to manifest more success in your life. Please give us a rating or review. We would love to see how the show has inspired you. You can also connect with Tech Diva Success on Twitter, Insta, and Facebook. We're very easy to find under that name. And we hope this episode was fire for you.